Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I kind of wish I was able to talk to you from some spring training outpost with warm weather in Florida or Arizona, but this is the world we live in now. We're all adapting. And I'm a little bit worried about where baseball is going forward from here for a lot of reasons. I mean, every sport, the television ratings have been down. And I think that's because of everything that's in play in terms of uh, the pandemic. And, and especially, I think when you look at games now, without people in the stands, they just aren't the same. It's just not the same kind of energy. Um, but more than that, the thing I think is the biggest threat to baseball. And I actually think it's the, the biggest existential threat to baseball since the Black Sox scandal is the fact that the game takes too much time, that the pace of the game is really slowing. And it's not something where you have to go back and say, hey, I wish they played like they did in the 40s, 50s, or 60s. And even in the last five years, the game has really slowed so that the amount of time in between pitches, especially, keeps getting extended. So for instance, last year, if you were watching the World Series, and not many of you were because the ratings were at an all-time low, again, there's other forces at play there. But if you were watching the last game of the World Series last year, the last 26 minutes of the game, let's say at last half hour of the game, you saw only two balls put in play. Two balls put in play in almost a half hour. And I'd like to say that was an anomaly, but it's not because the, just in the last six or seven years, the amount of time in between pitches has increased by about three seconds, which doesn't sound like much. But that adds up to 16 minutes of nothingness in the course of a game. And then you throw in the fact that there's a lot more strikeouts and the ball just when it is put in play it happens rarely. You wait a long time to see something actually happen. And if you were at the ballpark, maybe you don't mind because there are distractions, but the viewing experience has really slowed to the point where people are just not staying on games if they come to it in the first place. I mean, we have too many distractions, conveniences that are easily at our disposal to sit there and watch, you know, the batter stepping out of the batter's box, the pitcher stepping off the back of the mound. Our eyes, our brains have literally been retrained to create, create, to really crave movement. And a baseball game has become too static. You can argue about things about, you know, there should be more balls in play, should be more singles, should be more stolen bases, hit and runs, all great things about the aesthetics of the game. But it really comes down to movement in front of your eyes and what you're watching. Think about an NFL game, right? I think the no huddle offense and the spread offense and the amount of substitutions that happen are continually giving you the perception of action, even though there are breaks between plays but there's movement across the screen. Of course, sports like soccer and basketball and hockey, there's constant movement for the most part that really satisfy a craving for actual movement. So baseball really has to get to a point where they start making significant changes in the game to allow the ball to be put in play more and at a faster pace. And I'm not talking about some of the things they've done in recent years with you know, an automatic uh, intentional walk without having to go through the throwing four pitches wide. Um, last year, they said pitchers had to come into game and face at least three batters. That had really zero effect on the game. Uh, really significant changes. And I think baseball is at a point now where if the game doesn't look really different to you next year in 2022, and, and I mean really significant changes, uh, I think it's headed towards being more of a niche sport than anything else because this generation, this next generation of fans simply isn't getting hooked on the game the way a lot of us did growing up, who were old enough to remember when the game did at least move quickly or more quickly. So what's happening is baseball is giving their consumers, if you will, the antithesis of what it takes to make it in the entertainment world now. They're giving people less action over a longer period of time where everything that we now have at our disposal is about more, more action, more movement over a shorter period of time. So baseball really has to flip that. How do they do that? Well, <laughs> you can't do anything in baseball without having the players, the union, and MLB agree on what to do about it. That's a huge problem. And I say this is a, such a big year for baseball because this year is when the collective bargaining agreement is up. It runs out in December. Uh, there's almost no chance you're gonna see a, a new CBA before December. So like a lot of things with baseball, and this is true of high school students, because I remember it, you wait until you're up against the deadline to actually get your homework done. 
And that's been the case in baseball for most times. The CBA has come up when there have been really big issues. So uh, people say, well, do you think there's going to be a work stoppage next year? Because that's been all too familiar for anybody who's followed baseball for a long period of time. Uh, I tend to be optimistic and I want to be optimistic here because I think the motivating, the biggest motivating factor here is that whatever is on the other side of any kind of a work stop, it's strike or lockout, spring training lockout, whatever is on the other side of that is really bad. That's baseball's Armageddon. And I don't think baseball really comes back from that. I don't want to say it all, but anything close to what it's been in terms of economic health and fan interest. So that should be the motivating factor to get an agreement. Um, I you can go back to 1994 and 95 when there was no World Series in 94. They came back in 95, um, no spring training. That was delayed. They finally got something of an agreement back on the field. But think about how much the world has changed since then, 94 and 95, and especially baseball's position in the bigger entertainment industry you know, there's a lot more competition out there. Just think about video games alone, right? People may not watch a three hour baseball game, but there's a lot of people who are playing three hours of Call of, Call of Duty, no problem. Why? Again, it's the action, it's the motion uh, that really satisfies that urge. So, you know, baseball is not in a place in, in terms of uh, cultural significance in 2021, the way it was in 94, 95, to think, okay, if you shut the game down, baseball can always come back and people forgive and forget. Uh, if I were baseball, I'd be really worried about that. So the two sides have to come to an agreement to make the game really look different uh, in 2022 and going forward. Um, and so far, there's really a lack of trust that's probably as bad as it's been since 95 to try to arrive at that. So there hasn't been even a lot of dialogue. Uh, the lack of trust really means that any ideas that come up tend not to go anywhere because there's just this built-in kind of knee-jerk reaction to say, if you came up with that idea, it must not be a good one. It must be something you're trying to pull over us. So there's really no momentum for a deal right now. So you be prepared for lots of talk during the course of the summer and, and the fall, especially as we get to the postseason about, you know, is there going to be a strike? Is there going to be a lockout? Um, and I think those questions will be legitimate, but I just happen to think that, you know, again, sanity, if nothing else, will prevail and, and keep the game on the field for 2021 or 2022. As for this year, um, I think the play on the field is, it should be really interesting. I mean, I love the fact that teams like the San Diego Padres have really stepped up in a smaller market now of two $300 million players. The Dodgers Padres rivalry, to me, no offense to Yankees Red Sox, but that's the best, most interesting rivalry in the game. Certainly doesn't have the history, but there are players on the field who you really want to see. Um, and these teams were good last year. They'll be probably the two best teams or close to it in the National League this year. So I, I think that will help drive interest in the game. I think even though it's West Coast and I get it, the, the ratings aren't nearly as high when you have games start at 10 o'clock on a weeknight, but people want to know what happens with that rivalry. And these teams legitimately go after one another. I think you saw a little bit last year. So that will help. Uh, I think the Red Sox will be better. I mean, it's funny, these Yankees Red Sox games, you, you know, everybody's used to seeing them on Saturdays on Fox on Sunday night baseball. And I hear a lot of people myself complain that you guys are always showing the Yankees Red Sox. And it's true. But the fact is every time that they're shown the game, the ratings for those games blow away anything else. I mean, it's not even close, even when like last year, the Red Sox are not a very good team. So if you're a company that makes widgets and people like that widget, you're going to keep making that widget. So people are telling you numbers wise, they like Yankees Red Sox. So I get sort of the fatigue if you're a fan of another team, uh, but the ratings drive these decisions. And, and I think at least this year, I think the Red Sox will be a lot better than they were last year. Maybe not a playoff team, but pretty darn close to one. So it really helps when those two teams are, are playing well, that will help drive interest as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to a really interesting th season. I think the Rays are still really, really good. I think the Yankees should be really, really good. They need between Jamison Tyon, uh, Corey Kluber, and Luis Severino. They need two of those three guys to be healthy in October. I don't think they need them to make 30 starts in the course of a season. Um, but they need two of those three to really be 
pretty much in playoff shape and if not an ace close to it when they get to October, because I think this is still a, a 92 plus win team. Tampa Bay is right there with them. I'm still not writing them off. They're just really deep and really good. Um, and then you have the Mets. So around here, I think it's going to be super interesting because the Mets are a really good team. I think the addition of Lindor helps them in the one spot, I think has been underrated in terms of their Achilles heel and it's been their defense. They've been a bad defensive team now for four or five years and everybody talks about their pitching, but you can't be a really good pitching team unless you have really good defense and they were wasting their pitching. I thought with their defense, but Lindor is, I think right now he's the best defensive shortstop in baseball. He will really help. And the pitchers, I'm telling you, they're going to be many times this year, the pitchers are going to turn around and they're going to see a ground ball. that used to be a base hit turn into a double play that ends the inning and they get to walk off the field for that inning with a smile on their face. So big impact, but I will tell you, I am not underestimating the Atlanta Braves and I don't think a Mets fan should either. I, I think they're still the team to beat in that division. People forget they came within what 11 outs, I think of taking out the Dodgers in five games in the NLCS last year. And they've added Charlie Morton, Drew Smiley, and they had Mike Soroka back from his injury of last year. So Atlanta to me gets all my respect. They've won the division three years in a row. They pretty much have the same team, if not better, that's back. So the Mets, I get it. They're kind of the, the hot item this winter with the addition of Lindor and Steve Cohen owning the team, owning the team. and they are good. Um, but just uh, don't sleep on the Atlanta Braves. They're still really good. So in a nutshell, that's kind of, I think, where we're at. Again, I can't overemphasize enough how big of uh, an important season this is. We're not going to get our answers about you know, where the game goes from here until the off season, you will see some of these ideas about changing the game in play in the minor leagues. You might've noticed uh, in the last week or so, Major League Baseball is implementing some of these rule changes to speed up the game in the minor leagues. Uh, that's for two reasons. Number one, they don't need the union's approval to do that when it comes to rules in the minor leagues. And number two, they're kind of sending a, a signal to the union that, you know, we really do need to change the game and that this is kind of our lab. We can test these things out and it's things like uh, putting governors on shifts or outlawing them entirely um, that you can see it in practice, not just in theory. And it's, it's also, as I said, sort of a precursor to at least MLB saying, this is how much the game needs to change. These are some of the things that, that we'd like to see going forward. And if they get even half of what they put in the minor leagues this season, I think they might be happy with that. Um, so we'll see. I mean, again, I, I, I tend to be optimistic. It's like, <laughs> I'll never forget Hanley Ramirez when he was with the Dodgers had a sign in his locker and it said, attitude is a choice. So pick a good one. So you might as well be optimistic, right? There's a lot, <laughs> there's plenty enough reasons to be pessimistic in this world, but um, I am optimistic. And again, if there is <laughs> no work stoppage next year, I, to me, it means that they've come to an agreement on changing the game. And I actually look forward to the game changing. And I'm as much of a traditionalist as anybody. I still love National League Baseball much more than American League with the DH. So don't get me wrong. It's not like, you know, I, I think baseball needs to change just for the sake of change. I, I think it needs to change for the sake of sustainability and viability going forward. So in some ways you can say it's scary, but in some ways you can also say it's an opportunity for baseball, sort of like this whole pandemic for all of us to kind of take a reset of your life and where you're at and see what needs to change and what's what's valued and what's important and uh so i think it again i think you have to be optimistic here that there's something good on the other side of this yeah i think for the players the fact that they'd like to see players get uh more evenly comp fairly compensated earlier in their careers because the game now has become much younger it used to be that you got yourself on the free agent market around 30 years old and you got paid for what you have done. But if you look at the aging patterns in baseball now, it's amazing how players now get to the big leagues at a young age, really do well, and then kind of age out quickly. It's really become, because it's based so much on power, a young man's game. So the old model where, you know, we got so used to seeing those big contracts when guys hit the free agents market at 30, 31, just doesn't apply. So now you have people like say an Aaron Judge who made very little money in his first years with the Yankees making a tremendous impact on the team, clearly undervalued in terms of his production. How do you get those guys more money at the front part of their career? So 
that was part of the economic question. It's very difficult to kind of address. Do you have free agency earlier to put players out there on the market earlier? But that kind of takes away one of the greatest strengths I think baseball has is that homegrown players to me are the most valuable assets in the game. And you like to see your young players, if you're a Yankees fan, stay on the Yankees. Um, so I think the players are looking at things like um, more economic, um, let's say, parity in terms of younger players. And they also want teams, all teams, to try to win, which is kind of the basic thing you ask of a player, right? You go out there, give your best, try to win. But the game has changed in that if teams feel like they're not close to being a playoff team, they will really strip teams down. That word tanking, which I don't necessarily like, but um, there was a saying, and it still is in the game, that the worst place to be if you're a team is the middle of the road in terms of where you are in the winning curve. In other words, if you're close enough to being a postseason team, say like the Padres, yeah, you definitely go for it. But if you're not, say you're like an 80 win team, there's no reason for you to win 80 games. You might as well just win 62 uh, and just strip it down payroll wise and try to collect young players and rebuild over the next four or five years. Well, the players really don't like that. They think every team should be incentivized to win no matter where they are in the winning curve. And that's more of a philosophical thing than a structural item in terms of the CBA. Um, but that's a, that's a big, big concern for the players. So for the owners, I think their driving force is they'd be happy with status quo. If they rolled the CBA over, I think they'd be really happy with it. Um, so I think there's, there's not one issue here. In past years, there have been really one major issues and usually economics that have hung up the CBA. Um, but it, it's a lot of philosophical differences here that need to be ironed out. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Now, so far, it's hard to go by the information that we have in spring training um, because you're, they're being played in minor league parks mostly during the day. And especially in Arizona, the ball tends to fly and it's been windy out there. So we're not seeing a big change in the flight of the ball in spring training. But again, it's not exactly regular season conditions. But I do like the idea of it. You know, I almost hesitate to say dead or I'll say a less lively baseball because what baseball needs to do to have more balls in play is to incentivize different styles of play. And right now, everybody's playing by the same sheet of music. It's try to hit a home run, right? It, and that leads to a lot of strikeouts. So if you can incentivize the players that we saw a lot of in the 80s and the 90s, which is spray the ball around, you get rewarded for getting singles. Imagine that. Singles are actually harder to get, or at least at an all-time low than any time in history. So if you have players like a David Fletcher of the Angels who can, uh, his stock and trade is making contact, putting the ball in play. Well, I think if the ball is not as lively and if you're a seven, eight, nine hitter in a lineup who can hit a ball out the other way and now you can't, well, now you're incentivizing players to put the ball in play more. Um, so I like the idea behind it. I think it's certainly worth a shot. Um, there's lots of unintended consequences sometimes though. Um, I think the seams are a little bit higher, which may help improve breaking pitches more. So, you know, you never know until you put it in the real world, um, you go in with the best intentions, but how it plays out um, sometimes can be different. But I do like the idea of a less lively baseball to incentivize a different style of play. Um, I'm actually in favor of limiting the shift. And again, I, if you'd asked me maybe five or 10 years ago, I would have said that doesn't seem fair because what you seem to be penalizing um, you know, innovation and intellect in terms of defenses being able to do their homework, come up with these game plans and they work, right? Uh, we, don't we don't usually see that in other sports, but in this case, I think it, it has really affected the game so much that you do need to rebalance the, the balance between offense and defense and baseball, which happens in, in every sport, by the way, all the time and people don't complain. Um, you know, football, they change the rules every year it's a quarterback's league. We all know that defensive backs get their, their rules and limitations every year about what they can and cannot do. And it's mostly cannot do. Uh, basketball with rules regarding defensive uh, zones and outlawing those. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I like the fact that baseball ha you know, does have this tradition. Bud Selig used to always complain. He used to say to me, it's not fair that th these other sports can change their rules all the time. And you know, we always get slammed for trying to do anything a little bit different. And I used to tell them, but that's a good thing, though. People are, are holding the game to a higher standard, and you have this history that the other sports don't have and this tradition. That's a good thing. 
Um, so protecting that, I think, is important. But in this case, I think the shifts have really had such a difference uh, in terms of making the game less attractive. I just did a story with Francisco Lindor, who is on the executive board of the MLBPA, and he said, let's do away with the shift. And one of his reasons was, as he said, let me do me. You know, Let me play defense as a shortstop who can range rather than just be stationed in, a, in this position in short center field or short right field to take hits away from batters that have been hits for 100 years. Uh, as he said, the game incentivizes failure enough as it is now. Why are we continuing to incentivize it more by playing these shifts? So I think it has gotten to the point now where it has an effect on the game and it's changing the way the game is played. A quick story for you, Brian McCann, you might know him, played for the Yankees, mostly for the Braves, really good hitter, grew up, his dad was essentially his coach growing up and his dad would teach him, hit the ball up the middle, son. There's a lot of hits up the middle. Well, just as Brian got to the big leagues and had some success, that's when the shift started to become prevalent. The balls he's hitting up the middle that he was trained to hit that are base hits became outs. And, you know, if you know Brian McCann, he's not a fast runner. So if he puts the ball on the ground anywhere between the left side of second base and the right field line, he's going to be out. So when that happens, hitters, and I've seen it happen to many hitters, what do you do then? You adjust by trying to hit the ball in the air by trying to hit it over the shift. And when you do that, you're prone to striking out the swing and the miss. So if you can bring back some of these ground balls that are hits, and especially that bullet one hopper to the rover position in right field that was a hit for 100 years and now is just a normal 4-3 out, I, I think you have a better game. So I like the idea of two infielders on each side of, of second base uh, and having their feet in the dirt and let it go from there. Um, essentially, you're returning to how the game was played for 100 years and and I don't think, you know, you're necessarily, you know, telling teams that you can't do certain things from a strategic point of view. I think what you're doing is you're incentivizing different ways to play the game. The game is best when there's a diversity of styles, a diversity of everything, people, players, but especially a diversity of styles. Because right now you can only win one way, and that's the play this this three true outcome game of walks, home runs, and strikeouts. We'd rather see like a team like the 80 two Cardinals who can win a championship with a lot of speed and few home runs. Um, we want to see motion across the game. Well, I'm not sure it helps or hurts. It changes though. And here's why the, the, the fan now, and it's partly driven by social media, but general forces around our society. The fan now is a fan of individuals. And one of the things that traditionally has driven baseball is you're a fan of a team. And a lot of times you got your fandom from your parents or maybe an older brother. Uh, and you stayed with that team no matter whether your favorite player got traded or signed somewhere else. What's happening now is it, we're a highlight-driven society, and we're really plugged into <clears throat> the stars. So what happens is you get in the NBA, definitely player-driven league. The NFL is a quarterback-driven league. If you don't have a quarterback in the NFL, your team is bad and it's unwatchable. You have to have a quarterback and the promotion of the league is essentially is about quarterback play. So you have people who are fans of quarterbacks and that's what really drives the sport. So if your team quote unquote gets knocked out, you still watch these games because the teams left in the postseason have stars on them. It's not true in baseball. You know, if your team in baseball gets knocked out, you're generally not gonna continue to watch as the postseason goes along because baseball doesn't really lend itself to true stars. I mean, think about a guy like Mike Trout playing center field for the Angels. He might touch the ball in the outfield twice a game. He might get up four or in the longer game, five times in the game. Maybe he gets one or two hits. That's it. You know, Brady's got the ball in his hands every play. LeBron's got the ball in his hands whenever he wants and usually every possession. So it's hard for baseball to quote unquote market its stars when the game is not set up to be a star driven game. So when you talk about social media, you're passing along highlights, you know, gossip about players and what they're doing off the field. It doesn't really dovetail with what baseball traditionally has been. So it's hard for baseball to play that game of appealing to people on an individual basis. And I know one of the biggest concerns for players themselves is, hey, you don't mark us, market us enough to the fans. Well, the nature of the game itself doesn't really lend itself that way. So, um, you know, I don't know what the answer to that is. And I think as we get deeper into uh, 
gambling as you know kind of a, another attraction to sports that doesn't necessarily help baseball i think it in some ways you think it does because think about the course of a game there's a million things you can bet on right the average game is going to have like 300 pitches all kinds of different possible outcomes and players there's the permutations are there um, but it doesn't really necessarily drive it's not necessarily driven by the stars themselves so it, it gambling to me is you're following individuals more than teams right so if baseball is turning their players into highlight players i'm not sure that's that's good for the overall health of the game i think it's it's you know there's no question that teams look at it as a great revenue stream um, but whether it turns people into baseball fans uh, that i don't know but again you, you're dealing more in um in individuals you know there's a phrase now that maybe some of you have heard that I, I really think is dead on that we've turned into what what's being called an attention economy. And the people who generate and kind of uh, draw the most attention are the ones who are getting uh, really elevated status in society. And to stand out on social media, to stand out in this economy, you really need to call attention to yourself. And baseball traditionally hasn't been that kind of a sport again, where it's more of a team sport where you don't want to step out of, out of line. So um, it, it's an interesting question about where, where social media uh, sort of helps or hurts baseball. I think it more changes baseball and we'll see long term whether that turns out to be a positive or a negative. Yeah, again, I think it's hard for baseball to truly market its stars. I, I you know, I guess because I'm in media myself, I, I always think the more you know about the players themselves, um, I think the better it is for the game. So to me, access to players and who they are as people, that to me is how you market the game. I mean, you think about shows you might binge watch on Netflix and, and what it, people you might follow online you're plugged into the narrative of their lives, right? It's, it's not just their statistics or that they're good. You feel like you almost know these people. So being aspirational as well as inspirational is really important to drive interest. So to me, the more that, for instance, I know with Fox and with MLB Network, we, we try to put microphones on players all the time, either in batting practice or especially during the game. And I think people love that. I mean, you can go back to those old NFL films with Hank Stram and Super Bowl, whatever it was, two or four, whatever it was. I mean, that was ages ago, right? And, you know, LeBron is mic'd up in the championships and NBA finals, and, and Brady's been mic'd up in Super Bowls. We have a hard time getting players mic'd up for stupid batting practice before a game in July. Uh, it, you know, I, I think it really helps to show who these people are and what their personalities are. So when I think about marketing players, I think about marketing them as people. And the more you know about them, the more you care about them. It's true of, of any you know, actor or, or uh, a politician. And the more you know about them personally, the more you, you kind of relate to or even dislike their story, but at least you know their story. So I'm about narratives because of what I do, but I, I do think that also helps drive interest in the game. So the more you can do that, whether players do that themselves on social media, or, or some of the newer platforms, or whether they do it as a league, uh, I'd be all in favor of baseball doing more. Um, I think the robo is definitely coming. I, I think when you do it, you know, it has to be essentially foolproof. Uh, and they're not there quite there yet. Um, one of the issues they have is defining, literally defining the strike zone. Because right now, it's pretty much a three-dimensional strike zone. If you get any part of the plate, in or out, up or down, back or forth, you're going to get a called strike. You do that with a robo strike zone and you're going to get pitches called as strikes that have never been strikes, it, it, especially that real big overhand curveball that maybe, you know, drops over the plate really higher than the strike zone, but can get the back of the plate for a strike because it has such a drop to it. That should not be a strike. So what they're trying to do is figure out how to really define it. And I think what they, the answer would be maybe define it two dimensionally to the front of the plate, anything that hits the front of the plate there, which would sort of change the game in terms of what hitters understand to be a strike zone. But I do like the idea of normalizing, if you will, the strike zone. We're pretty darn close to it. We're way better than we were say 20 years ago when umpires had individual strike zones. 
I think the fact that they're graded on this laser laser technology that really defines it now um, really has, especially with the younger umpires, made a more uniform strike zone. But there's no question. One thing the catchers hate if we go to robos is that skill of being able to frame a pitch to make it look like a strike that's not a strike. I could go either way on that. On the one hand, I think, well, if it's not a strike, it shouldn't be a strike, right? And on the other hand, that's something of a skill that you'd be taking away from people. I mean, think about a catcher like Roberto Perez of the Cleveland Indians, not a good hitter, but he's a great framer of pitches and he makes a really big difference on how good their pitching is. You take that away and you know he's essentially as good or as bad as Gary Sanchez behind the plate, who's not so good at framing pitches. Uh, is that fair? I don't know if it's fair, but I think a strike zone that's uniform for everybody is certainly fair. So I do think it's coming. Um, it will be tried again in the minor leagues. It's been tried again before. Uh, as the te technology gets better and better, and it is, um, you know, I think you will see it. I, I would say within five years, probably somewhere around three years, I think you'll see it. You'll still have an umpire behind the plate, by the way. Just like in tennis, we still have linesmen, but we have the Hawkeye system. Um, you still need someone back there to kind of administer the game to you know, they'll have a, a earpiece where they'll have some buzz or something that the robo um, tells them strike or ball. Um, but you're still de you still need someone behind the plate. So to the fan looking at the game, you're not going to see a robot back there. You're not going to see anybody. It will look the same. It'll just be technology calling the pitches rather than the umpire. Oh, right. no, I wasn't a Strato guy. I was on the, if anybody remembers this, Ethan Allen All-Stars. It was one of those spinner games with cards with players similar to Stratomatic with cards, but it was uh, Ethan Allen all-star game. Yeah, well, for me, I think social media age hasn't changed me that much because I haven't been involved in it. I mean, listen, I know it's changed the business, there's no question about it. I think it's made people, um, people just don't read as much. So thankfully, in the course of my career, I've been able to branch out and do more in terms of uh, visual media and television. Um, but it just doesn't suit me. I mean, I, I don't like the idea of self-promotion. Um, I don't like the idea of, first of all, the English language just getting completely butchered. I, I don't know. I'm a stickler for spelling and grammar and things like that. So that certainly goes out the window in social media. Um, again, it gets back to this idea of attention economy. I always wanted my, the work that I did to, to stand on its own. I wouldn't mind if I didn't have a byline on my stories. I'd rather, you know, let my work talk for me. I don't need to sell myself. So, um, you know, I think there's also a lot, a lot of negativity. It's kind of, it's a polluted river that I don't want to swim in. Um, I think about if you wrote a letter to the editor back in the day of the newspaper, which is how most people needed to be heard, you know, they would call you up. They would verify who you were. You would have your name signed to it. Uh, you know, uh, those checks and balances are gone, which has an upside to it. Don't get me wrong. It gives voice to a lot of people who otherwise don't have a voice, but you're looking at a system now that has really few checks and balances and it tends on the negative side because that, again, that's what's going to get the most attention. If you say life is great and, you know, I love my dog and it's not going to get as many likes as if you rip somebody who said something, you know, out of turn in a baseball broadcast that night. So it's driven mostly by negativity. I don't like dealing in negativity. And again, it's, I'm not saying it's, it's not a good medium uh, or media, but it's just, it doesn't fit, you know, kind of things that I like to do. I, I like craftsmanship, uh, subtlety, all those things disappear when you talk about social media. Yeah, the Ken Burns documentaries are amazing. I mean, even if you've seen them before, and we rerun them all the time on MLB Network, and I'm kind of amazed that every time we run them, they actually do pretty well ratings-wise. I was like, are there any people left who haven't seen it? But I think it's a bunch of people who see it multiple times. And, and I was lucky enough, I worked with Ken Burns on his follow-up to that 10th inning as a consultant. And I, just being able to see kind of the way you know, it's put together and the work they put in, I, I was blown away. I, I think Ken Burns is he's kind of like our Mark Twain of this generation in terms of storytelling, uh, a, just a great American storyteller and his stuff other than baseball, obviously is terrific too. So that what really comes to mind immediately. Um, so I, I would definitely start with that. Ba other baseball documentaries. I mean, Bobby Valentine did a really good one that he was, I think, producer for I think it was called Sugar about uh, prospects in the Dominican Republic. 
trying to make it into professional baseball, really good behind the scenes look at uh, stories that generally aren't told. Um, and you know, blowing our own horn here, I think MLB Network, we've done a lot of cool documentaries, historical documentaries um, you know, on the A's back in the day. We did a really good one on Billy Martin, uh, Reggie Jackson, um, the Nasty Boys of the Cincinnati Reds bullpen back in the 90s. Um, I, I kind of love that stuff, especially it brings me back to some of the teams back when I was a kid watching baseball. So um, yeah, good question. Yeah, it's an important question. I think it always has been because you'd like to some of these teams to hold on to their players. I think there's really a uh, residual value to having not just a good player, but a, a franchise player. Someone now with Francis with uh, Tatis. I'm not sure if he's going to stay in in, uh, in San Diego throughout the course of that contract. But you'd like to think that you know the Ripkins and the Gwins and the Jeters of the world um, continue to give value even when they're when their uh, performance starts to decline because they, they become franchise players. Um, I don't know that that will ever be solved. I think there will always be disparity just by the nature of the game. Baseball is much more regionally strong than it is nationally strong. So for instance, you have a market like Milwaukee or Pittsburgh or Cincinnati. These are very small media markets when you look at it and smaller in a lot of cases than some markets that don't even have major league baseball. And it's just economically tough for them to compete at the same level. It's just not going to happen. Um, so in some cases, it, it's, you know, a fact of the game that these teams go through cycles, whereas teams like the Dodgers and the Yankees and now the Mets should not go through up and down cycles. They should always be at least good because they have such a, a, an advantage in resources. Uh, so I don't personally, I don't think there's a way to solve that. I, you'll never see uh, people bring up the idea of a salary cap. You know, why don't baseball do that? Because it does work well in football where Green Bay can be just as good as, as New York um, and in basketball. But the Baseball Players Association just is not going to accept even a floor. Uh, it's certainly not going to put a cap on salaries. They want the free market. So I don't think that will ever just... I, ever is a long time. I understand that, but the players association is so against any kind of a cap or limit that I just don't see that kind of system working in baseball. So you try to do the best you can in the quote unquote free market system. But I do think those teams will always be disadvantaged just because, you know, to, to, the local markets are driven by two things. One um, is your local media package. So you just can't get as much local TV revenue as you can in a smaller market. Um, and, and the other way you're talking about that is really corporate support. So in a place like Tampa, which seems like a great place to have baseball, there's just not a lot of Fortune 500 companies within a range of St. Petersburg ballpark. So it, the season ticket base is really driven by corporate money. You need a strong corporate base. So that's why a place like, say, Nashville, Tennessee, or Charlotte, places that are upcoming with corporate support and general uh, income uh, demographics are pretty good, look like they're better options down the road. Um, so those are the two things that stand out to me for these smaller markets that I just don't think they, they're able to overcome. Well, not in any kind of decision making for sure, um, but I have spoken with some people, uh, you know, about some of these ideas. And I, first of all, I think one of the best things that um, Commissioner Rob Manfred has done is bring in Theo Epstein and Raul Abanez. They're sort of, um, I don't know what their official titles are, but they're they're sort of in charge of trying to get these changes into the ecosystem of baseball. So to do that, you can't come out with rules and just say, this is the way we're doing it. You have to engage the players in the course of arriving at where you want to be. You know, you can't have these rules come on down from high again, because there's so, there's so much distrust players, even if they thought it was a good idea are not going to say it's a good idea. So um, I like the idea that, Guys like Theo Epstein, who obviously had a great success running the Red Sox and Cubs, and Ro Raul Abanya is really well respected as a player, kind of can bring some of the player sensibility to some of these ideas and engage the players themselves, either individually or in groups, uh, as part of this process of getting to the point of significant change. I'm talking about real change. And players, I get it. You know, if you're a baseball player, you're into your routine. Your job is to listen, survive pitch by pitch, pretty much at bat by at bat. You're not thinking globally about where is baseball in five years. That's not the player's job. 
But I do like the fact that Theo Epstein and Raul Banez will be engaging, I think, engaging players and helping this get through. So whatever I can do to kind of get, you know, things out there in the media or, you know, suggest ideas, I mean, I, I'd be all for that because I, I haven't been a fan of a team since I was a little kid. I'm just a fan of baseball. I like going to the ballpark and knowing that if one team loses, <laughs> I don't care. I mean, I don't live and die with the outcome of the game. I kind of root for extra innings. I, I like, I root for good stories and, you know, and good players or good narratives. Uh, so I look at the game from a pure intentional point of view, not uh, biased in terms of one team, one side or the other. Uh, I actually think that's a luxury for me that I really, really enjoy. So my agenda is just, I, I want to see the game do well. I'm obviously partly self-serving because it's good for my business, but um, I, I just like, I'm a fan of baseball more than I am of, of, of a particular team. So I, I root for the game to do well. So whatever I can do, I'm certainly willing. Yeah, well, thanks for sticking around and popping up on this Zoom. I'm glad we have this kind of technology to kind of at least virtually meet with everybody. And I mean, Seton Hall Prep is, always been and always will be such an important part of my life first of all even before I got to Seton Hall of course with my dad and hanging out at you know even the practices for baseball and football I, I feel like I'm lucky as a journalist that you know my perspective that I try to bring to what I do is is really more driven inside out most people come to this sport or to the business of covering sports with a perspective outside in, right? So I try to look from the inside out, which is sort of from a coach's perspective. And I, I think I like that first of all, but I think it also gives me something of an advantage because I, I saw growing up what it takes behind the scenes, not just to play the actual game on game day, but leading up to the game, the kind of discipline and lessons that are important to arrive at that point. So when I cover sports, I certainly have a respect for the work that goes into what people do and not be so result oriented, which is the way most people do look at sports and, and cover sports. So Seton Hall has been really important to me and also in terms of getting myself prepared for college. I, I remember going to college and being somewhat, you know, anxious like people are, you know, I had this vision of college and how hard it is and not that it's easy, but when I got there, I understood how well I was prepared for it with my years at the prep. So I'm always thankful for that because I'm lucky enough to be someone who always knew what I wanted to do and was able to do it. I mean, I never thought about television, but in terms of writing about sports, that was all I wanted to do. And so when I got to college and was on the, a track of, of, of what I wanted to do, that I knew right away my freshman year that Seton Hall had prepared me really well uh, to get through it, not just academically, but the self-discipline that it takes to do something that you want to do. It's one thing to say, hey, I want to do it, but it's another thing to actually go through the processes of making that happen. So um, I, I think about Seton Hall all the time in terms of how it has prepared me to, to do really a lifelong dream and it should be anybody's to do exactly what you want to do.